Now, we live in a world today that everybody seems to be getting offended very easily. You know, I see it all the time. There's all these different groups and factions and people are dividing and just getting offended over like the smallest things. I remember when I was growing up as a kid, you know, you'd call names to each other and it really wasn't that big of a deal. Now, I'm not saying that name calling is nice or that's something that people should be doing, but people have more of a, it seemed a little bit thicker skin, right? You, you know, someone could call you, that's why they had the, the phrase, I remember when I was a kid, you know, sticks and stones may break your bones, but names can never hurt you, right? So if someone's calling you names, you're just supposed to shrug it off and just say whatever, it's not that big of a deal. Right? But now we have all these different movements and people. I mean, it's getting so ridiculous. One of the, one of the more recent things I saw was, um, you know, the football team, the, the Washington Redskins, right? I mean, it's the name of a t football team. It's been around for a super long time. But there's some people say, well, that's offensive. Saying the Redskins, that's offensive. You know, and all these different terms, it's just people are just so offended by them and they, they're getting so worked up and trying to get everyone to, you know, just, there's a lot of, it gets to a point of ridiculousness with the amount of, of offense that people take. Now, I'm going to teach you tonight that as Christians, we shouldn't be so easily offended. We shouldn't let things bother us so much. We should be able to let these things roll off of our back. But, um, you know, it's not a big surprise that the world is offended, but one of the things that the world gets offended at the most, see, there's a lot of goofy people, and you could say, oh, that's just this really small group of people that are getting offended, and they're just making a big stink about it, right? And that is the case in, in many of these cases, and they just get this, this massive attention for whatever reason. But what the world gets offended at more than anything else is the preaching of the Bible. The preaching of God's Word is highly offensive to many people these days. And there are a lot of topics that are covered in the Bible that this world will be extremely offended about. Now, here at Word of Truth Baptist Church, I'm not going to dance around or tiptoe around the, the parts of the Bible where people get offended by. So just I just want to let you know that right away because there's going to be topics that you might even get offended at. But we need to make sure that when, if you do get offended, if or when you get offended, are you offended at something that I say that's just my opinion? Or are you offended at something that the Bible actually clearly teaches? So one of the ways that I preach is that I try to, to give as much scriptural evidence as possible so that you can see why I believe what I believe and why I'm teaching the things that I teach. That it's not just something that like, oh yeah, Pastor Burzins, he just, just for whatever reason, you know, believes something and he just wants us to buy it. No, I'm not like these preachers that will take one verse out of the Bible and then spend a whole hour preaching on that one verse and just coming up with all their own thoughts. I'm going to try to prove everything tonight from the Scripture. And I'm going to point, we started off in Psalm 73. Because remember I said the world is always offended at the truth. Psalm 73, if you remember, we just read through this chapter. At the beginning part, he's talking about people who are rich and have everything going for them, but they, but they despise God. They don't care about God at all. They say, um, he says in verse 3, I was envious at the foolish. So he's looking at people who are foolish and he's starting to envy them because he sees them, you know, living it up and having these, this, this illusion, at least it looks like this great life and they don't care about God and everything seems to be going their way. He says, um, verse 5, he says in verse 4, for there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Everything's going great for them. They're not, you know, they're healthy, they're not in sickness, everything's to be going great. He says in verse 6, therefore pride compassed them about as a chain, violence covered them as a garment. So he's saying, because they have everything going for them, they, they become very proud. They become very arrogant, very haughty thinking that they're better than everybody else. Now, there are people that are like that today in our world. 
You think about a lot of the, you know, people in our culture and our society look up to, say, movie stars or rock stars, and they say, wow, they have everything. They have these multi-million dollar houses. They've got it made. They don't, they, all they got to do is act. They don't even have to really work that hard. They could spend all this time playing and enjoying themselves and doing whatever they want to do because they have all this money, and oh, isn't that such a great life? And they seem to be in such good health, and they, they're always married to these beautiful people and all this, you know, and, and people look at that life, and they're so envious of it. And the vast majority, probably 99% of, of the Hollywood movie stars don't really care about God. Now, maybe they may give lip service to God. They might say every once in a while a brief mention or something, but they don't really care in their heart about God. They're not going to church. They're not trying to do what's right by the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, they're, they're acting out movies that depict all kinds of sin and blasphemy and things that are bad. And this is, this is what um, you know, David is referring to, or, or Asaph, in Psalm 73. Um, he says in verse 7, Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. Again, just talking about how rich these people are. Verse 8, They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore his people return hither, and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. And they say, How doth God know? See, this is where they don't care about God. How doth God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? They're arrogantly just, just blowing God off, basically. Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. So he was said earlier, you know, I, I was looking at these people and being envious of them because it looked like they could just not care about God and they're in riches and everything's going great for them. Yet I'm here in poverty. I'm here with struggles and trials and things are going bad in my life. And I'm looking at these people, you know, and I'm trying to do what's right by God, yet they're not caring at all about God. They're proud. They're haughty. They're arrogant. They have all this money and things seem to be going great. So you're saying, I don't get this, God. I looked at them and I foolishly was envious at those people. But then he realizes why it was so foolish to be envious in the first place of these people. He says, in verse number 17, he says, Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. So he's saying, yeah, right now everything seems to be going great for them. But when I, went, when I got to church, when I went to, to the house of God, and I actually heard the truth about it, then I understood what their end is going to be. He says in verse 18, Surely thou didst set them in slippery places, thou castest them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation as in a moment? They are utterly consumed with terrors. This is talking about them dying and going to hell. Yeah, you know, it, it can look like, you know, people can mock God on this earth. They could be proud and lifted up in themselves because they have all these riches. But they don't understand that, that this is just going to last a moment. And, and how great they think they have it now, they're going to end up dying and going to hell one day. And that is nothing to be envious of. We ought not to be looking at the people that have all these riches and the fame and the glory and, and being envious of it because those people, the, the, wicked, the wicked people that are in that position are going to be going to hell. We are going to have struggles. But look at, the, that, that's not really, the, you know, I'm trying to get, I'm getting a little bit sidetracked from the point of the sermon. He explains all these people, then he understands that um, their end, that they're going to be end up going to hell. But look at... Um, Verse 11, we already read through this a little bit. He said, and they say, how doth God know and is there knowledge in the most high? Behold, these are the ungodly which, who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency. For all the day long, I have been plagued. So now he's comparing himself to, to these people with all these riches. I have been plagued and chastened every morning. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. So he's saying, if I'm going to speak what's right and do what's right, then I'm going to be offensive unto this generation, to the generation of thy children. Now, God's word is always going to be offensive to the world in general. Now, some things they're okay with. They're okay with the love part, right? 
the world's going to be okay with, hey, treat your neighbor the way you'd like to be treated, those types of things. That's great. No one seems to have a problem with that message. But that's not all of the Bible. There's lots of things in the Bible. There's lots of laws. There's lots of commandments that people get offended at. Now, if you find yourself in a situation of getting offended, you must first determine if what was said is true according to Scripture, as I mentioned earlier. If it is, if what is said, if what you hear taught or preached is true, if you could see it in the Bible, then the world has been brainwashing you to accept or to become tolerant of sin. Because that's what the devil wants to do, and that's what the world tries to do, is they try to minimize sin and say, oh, it's not that big of a deal, it's really not that bad, I don't see what the big deal is, everybody's doing this, it's fine. And, and when you start getting more tolerant of that, that is oftentimes when you'll hear the, the stark direct preaching or the stark direct commandments or what, what have you from the Bible. Turn, if you would, real quick to Leviticus chapter 20 in the Old Testament. Just to make an illustration, and, and you know, this is not my favorite illustration, but it's an easy one to bring up these days. Because so many people don't read their Bible. So many people are, are just being influenced by the, the media, by the television, by the movies, into accepting abominable sin. And even, you know, the verse we're going to read, believe it or not, it's not even legal to read this in Canada. There are parts of, yes, reading parts of the Bible is illegal in Canada because it's considered hate speech. You're in Leviticus chapter 20. It's, a, it's in Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, the third book of the Bible. Look at verse 13. The Bible says, If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. This isn't popular in today's world. The world today is trying to get you to accept that homosexuality is fine, it's normal, it's just a lifestyle choice, it's just what other people choose to do, but there's nothing wrong with that, everything's just fine, but that is not what the Bible says. People will literally get offended if you say, yes, I believe that this is God's word, I believe that God meant everything that he wrote here, and I believe that God calls this a sin, an abomination. Now, it's not just this one thing, but this is, this is what the, the agenda is today to push people into just accepting this and say, that's fine. But this is also something that, that when you preach this and you preach this hard and strong and loudly and just say, look, this is what the Bible says. This is what God thinks. It's abomination. It's filthy. It's vile. It's disgusting. It's unnatural. It's not the way that God designed it. And that anyone who does this is committing an abomination that God said is worthy of the death penalty. People get offended at that. Even Christians get offended at this. And look, I'm just saying, does the Bible say that or not? Are we reading this right? I mean, if you want to go to the New Testament, we go to the New Testament, and we go to Romans chapter 1. You say, oh, that's just the Old Testament. No, it's all throughout the Bible. And this was never negated. This is not something that's, that, that God has repealed. Romans chapter 1 explains the same thing, and it, and it, and it, and it explains, we'll, we'll, read, we'll read through this whole thing, Romans chapter 1, starting in verse 21. People need to hear this today and not get offended. Romans 1, verse 21. The Bible says, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. This is talking about a specific person or their type of people, group of people that, that knew God. At one point, they knew God. They knew who God was. They heard about Jesus Christ. They heard about the Lord. But they glorified him not as God, and they became vain in their imaginations. They, they just dreamed up whatever they wanted to dream up for themselves, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image 
made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. So they made I idols for themselves to be their gods. Verse 24, wherefore, which means because of this, because they did all this, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, because they did these things, God gave them up unto vile affections. You don't find this preached very many places these days. Look, the Bible's talking about God giving up on people. He says God gave them up unto vile. Vile means dirty, disgusting affections. And he explains that even further. He says, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. They're doing things against God's design, against nature. They're having affection with other women. God designed a man and a woman to be together, and anything, and that is natural, and anything other than that is unnatural. He goes on further. He says in verse 27, And likewise, just like the women are doing it, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. So because they didn't want to have anything to do with God, they didn't like to keep God in their knowledge, God gave them over to this reprobate mind to do these disgusting, vile acts between themselves. Verse 29 now explains, it goes through this whole litany of things that are attributes of the reprobate, of these people who are rejected by God, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So here we see in the New Testament saying that they're worthy of death, these things, these sins they commit, they're worthy of death, that God has given them up to do these things which are not convenient. And these are the attributes of someone who's given up unto these vile affections. And again, decide for yourself. We just read the scripture. I'm trying not to add my own words unto this. I want you to see for yourself what the Bible says because we are being attacked. God's word is being attacked today. And we are trying to be told that, that these things aren't that big of a deal. Yet the Bible says in the Old and New Testament that it's worthy of death. And it's not just the homosexuality. I mean, that's an easy one because that's the, the current target of the agenda of trying to get people to accept that as being normal. But it also is even, I mean, think about adultery. You don't have to turn there again, but in Leviticus 20, verse 10, the Bible says, And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. But what do we see today if you were to turn on a Hollywood movie or the TV shows? How many times are people committing adultery? I mean, literally. And, and, it's, and it's being presented as something that it's not that big of a deal. It happens. Like, oh, oh, yeah, this was really bad. I can't believe you committed adultery. But then they just get a divorce and everything's fine and they move on and they go do other things. The Bible says that, that committing that sin, again, it's worthy of the death penalty. We minimize how bad sins are these days because we're being brainwashed by, by, by a world that wants to be more accepting of sin and just say that it's, it's really not that big of a deal. Now, anyone who's, who's been cheated on knows that it is a big deal. But the way that it's portrayed, you wouldn't think so. 
When, when, and I know this firsthand. I don't watch movies anymore, but I would, we used to watch movies. You, you would see these, these sad stories of people that, that would, would have you know, the, the uncaring husband or the, the unloving wife, and, and they became friends with this man or this woman on the job, and one thing just kind of led to another, and, and, and it's designed to make you have sympathy for these people who commit and act a... a, a, a breaking God's law that's worthy of the death penalty to make you kind of feel sorry for them and feel sad for them for, for cheating on their spouse. That is not the attitude that we need to have towards these sins. When you start to have the, the, to, the, the I mean, for better word, lack of a better word, tolerant, tolerance of the sin, it makes you a little bit more susceptible or prone to committing something like that. Now, these are just two examples, but we could go on and on down the list. And as you preach these things, people are going to get offended. People are going are to say, I don't like that. I don't like the way that sounds. Well, look, is the Bible teaching this or not? Now, we as, as, as Christians should not get so easily offended, especially especially when we hear the Word of God. I know the world's going to get offended at this preaching. I know it. They don't want to hear it. Nobody wants to, look, nobody wants to hear that they're in sin. Well, unless you're wise and you want to be reproved, you want to be told that you're doing something wrong because you want to get right with God. I, I for one, I, I would rather have it, let it be known unto me, hey, Rip my face off with a sermon from God's Word that says, man, you are in sin. You didn't even realize it because I want to be right with God. I want God's blessing. As His child, as a born-again believer, I want, to please, I want to please my Father. I want to please my Heavenly Father, the Lord, and, and I want to do what's right by Him. And if there's something I'm doing that's wrong, I'd rather have it point out to me. And, and anybody who's wise is going to have that same attitude. They're going to say, you know what? I want to have the proper attitude against it. I want to know what God wants for me to know. I want to read this book and understand it and just be able to, to do what God has for me to do. And now look, I know I'm not going to be perfect. I'm not claiming to be perfect. But it's a certain attitude that we all ought to have. It's a humble attitude that's able to accept correction and just say, okay, well, I guess I was wrong about that. Instead of one that says... Wow, I can't believe you said I, you know, I'm, I'm offended by this. And oftentimes when people get offended at the, the two things that I just mentioned, whether homosexuality or adultery, and like I said, the list could go on and on, it's usually because either you've been involved in something like that or you have a relative or something that, that's in that sin and you love them and, and whatever and you just don't want to hear the truth. But we ought not to get offended. Psalm 119 verse 165 says, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. We ought not to get offended. I mean, like I said, especially at God's word, but even other things. You know, don't let people offend you. We've got God's word for the truth. You know, if other people say or do things either about you or about the Bible or, or mock you for believing God's word, don't let that offend you. That doesn't change what's right and wrong. God's word isn't going to change based on what other people say. Don't let them offend you and, and feel like, like you need to be offended. Hey, if you love God's law, the Bible says nothing shall offend you. Turn, if you would, to um, Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. I'm going to read for you from Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, verse 4, Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor of the gospel preached to them. This is when John was kind of doubting. He sent his, his disciples to go and see, you know, are you really the Christ? They sent him to Jesus. Because he was kind of doubting. And, and Jesus answered, and he says, okay, go show John these things. You know, let him know, you know, the blind are receiving their sight, the lame are walking, the lepers are being cleansed, the poor of the gospel preached unto them. Verse 6 says, and blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. We ought not to be offended, especially in Christ, and the things that Jesus Christ is, stands for and teaches and preaches. Let's not be offended in him. G you know, see, John the Baptist was thrown into prison over Jesus Christ. Over, it, over specifically preaching that it was wrong for Herod to have his brother's wife. 
Herod's brother was married to a woman, got a divorce, and Herod married that woman. And John the Baptist said, that's wrong. That's a sin. You ought not to be doing that. That's against God's word. That's a wicked sin. And he got thrown in jail for that. And he's probably, he's sitting in jail going, what am I doing in jail if, this is, you know, if Jesus is here? And a lot of people at that time had the had false conception that Jesus was going to come and, and start his, his reign on earth. They were getting the, the second coming of Jesus a little bit mixed up with the first coming of Jesus. So he's probably thinking, uh, you know, I've been sitting in jail for a while, Jesus. Are you going to come and set things up and free me out of here? So it's, he was starting to doubt a little bit. But Jesus said, Let, no, 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 uh, you know, I'm definitely the Christ. And he, and he was kind of explaining all the miracles that were being done. And he said, blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. But you're in Matthew 13. Let me get there myself because I want to read a little bit of this. Matthew 13, we're going to look at the parable of the, of the sower. Let's start reading in uh, verse number 3. Matthew 13, verse number 3. And he spake many things unto them in parables. So this is a parable saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth. And forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some an hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. So he's teaching something. Now, obviously, the, the, what he's trying to teach is not just about this sower who's sowing seeds. There's a deeper meaning behind that. He's just using this as an example. There's someone sowing seeds, and, and you know, sometimes the seeds just fall into the, into the stony ground. Sometimes it falls into the good ground. And he's explaining all these different things that happen. And you say, okay, yeah, this makes sense. Of course that would happen. But there's a deeper meaning, and he explains that in verse 18. He says, hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. So he's going to explain it to him. What does that even mean? What, what, who are you talking about, this sower? What, what's he doing? Why, why are you giving us this parable? Verse 19, when anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside. So the seed that was received by the wayside, it said the birds came and devoured them up, they just ate it. He's likening this to someone who hears the word of God, who hears the Bible preached unto them. Maybe they hear about Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. And they don't understand it. They don't quite get it. They don't understand the free gift of salvation. And... Because they don't understand it, he says, Then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. So the thing that was, that was trying to be explained unto them, they didn't get it, it gets taken away. The devil comes and wants to take that away because he doesn't want that seed to take root in their heart where they can actually receive it and be saved. And he says, that's the first seed that he mentioned. Verse 20, But he that received the seed into stony places, the same is he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. They receive God's word. They receive Christ. I believe this is, talk, this is he's, he's referencing salvation here. They receive God's word. They receive Christ. But verse 21 says, Yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while, for when tribulation or persecution ariseth, because of the word, by and by he is offended. He also that receives, and then it goes on to explain the, the thorns and that the cares of this world choke that out. But I want to focus in on the one that was, the seed that was sown in the stony places because it says, okay, he received the word. There are people today that get saved. They put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But they have no root. They're not grounded and founded in the Bible. They don't really know a lot about God's word. And they don't really get plugged into church. And they, they, you know, they're, they're, not, they're not rooted down and firmly planted, right? So... When trouble arises, when persecution comes, when people start making fun of you or, or start you know, bad-mouthing you or whatever, and you start to receive some persecution because of what you believe, they say these people get offended. 
They get offended and then they don't, they don't end up bringing forth fruit. They don't end up serving God the, the way that they're supposed to because um, they get offended by people who persecute them because of God's word. And the Bible says, Yea, and all that shall live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Anyone who wants to, to, to do what's right and actually tries to change your life and do the right thing, you can expect to receive persecution. It's going to come. It's not a pleasant thought. It's not something that, that, that I enjoy telling people. But it is a warning. It's something that we can understand. Hey, it's going to come. Let's just be prepared. Let's not get shocked. Let's not get offended when people come at us because of what we believe, because we believe God's word. Hey, Jesus Christ already warned us this is going to happen. And, some, and for some people, it's too much for them. And because, because they get offended, they don't end up doing any more for God. And that's sad. Now, it's easy to cast blame. On, turn, if you would, to Mark chapter 6. You're in Matthew. Just go a little bit more forward to Mark chapter 6. It's real easy to cast blame on the person that's giving the message, right? And be offended, like, for example, at me. I say something like, oh, man, I'm offended at that. It's real easy to just, to just point all the blame at me. I remember when my wife and I got married, you know, I was, a lot of people in her family didn't like me because of what I believe, because I believe the Bible. And now she believes the same things that I believe, but whenever, whenever they would, you know, she would say something, of course, I was the, the, the person that the hatred was directed at, the persecution was directed at, was at me, because it's my fault. They're like, yeah, yeah, she doesn't really believe that. It's him that believes that, and she's just saying these things. So it was always focused on me. I was the bad guy. And I'm okay with being the bad guy. Like I said, I have thick skin. I'm able, I'm able to deal with it. It's not that big of a deal. But it's easy, and that's what people always want to throw the blame on someone else. And for me... It was my former pastor with my family. They didn't like the things that I believe. They didn't like what I say. So they wouldn't really blame it on me. They were just like, oh, yeah, well, it's his pastor. He's the one that's the bad guy. You know, he's the one that they want to push the blame off on. Instead of just taking the word for what it says, I mean, look, I'll have an honest discussion with anybody about any of these topics. If you do get offended, and I'll tell you this now, if you get offended by something that I preach, Talk to me after the service and I'll try to show you more verses and try to prove it more in depth or explain it a little bit better than maybe I was able to do during the sermon. Because I, honestly, I'm interested in the truth and preaching the truth and not backing down from the truth. Sometimes the truth can be offensive to people and that's why I'm giving you warning. Hey, that, that's going to happen. And sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's great. Hey, we love like the, the truth of salvation. There is nothing better than that. That is good news for everybody. Receiving that free gift of salvation. We love it. But as much as God is love and that God is, has great mercy and long suffering, God also has anger and he has wrath and he has vengeance. These are two sides of God. We need to know both of them. There are things in this world, girls, sit still. There are things in this world, you know, the, the world wants nothing to do with God by and large. I mean, individuals, yeah, there are certain individuals that do. But, but, you know, the Bible says that Satan is basically running the, the show here on earth. He's, he's you know, there's spiritual uh, wickedness in high places. And he doesn't want people to get saved. And he's always trying to get people to believe that sin's not that big of a deal. We need to look at this and, and just understand what it says so that we could try to be right with God. Now, I do turn to Mark chapter 6. I mentioned it's easy to put the blame on the person who's, who's bringing the message instead of the content of the message itself. Mark chapter 6, look at verse number 2. And this is in reference to Jesus Christ. Now, look, I know I'm no Jesus Christ, but if you look at what they did to Jesus, it's no surprise that it would happen to anybody else that's a follower of Jesus. Verse number 2 says, And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things? They're saying, Where did he come up with these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? It, look at verse 3. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and of Judah and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. So here's Jesus Christ. He's preaching. 
He's preaching with power and authority. He's preaching God's Word. He's preaching good, sound doctrine. Obviously, because it's coming out of the mouth of Jesus Christ. You can't get better doctrine than what's coming out of His mouth. And they're wondering, saying, wait, well, where does he have this wisdom? He's just a carpenter. I mean, think about a carpenter. Think about the guy that builds the houses out here, right? And they're like, who is this guy to teach us the Bible? He's not a Pharisee. He's not a priest. Who, who is this guy? But instead of worrying about the person, they should be more worried about the content. What, what is he actually saying? You know, people oftentimes can, give, can give, uh, give me a hard time and say, oh, well, you can dismiss my preaching because I didn't go to Bible college. And that's what they were trying to do here with Jesus. Oh, he's just a carpenter. We know his family. We know his brothers. We know his sisters. That's just Jesus. That's just this carpenter guy. What does he know? Judge what he's saying. He's doing my mighty works. He was, he was performing the miracles. He was doing all these things, but the, but the content of his message is what mattered. You can dismiss what I preach because I didn't go to Bible college, but you ought to judge the content compared to the Bible. Now look, I am not ashamed that I did not go to a seminary school. I didn't go to Bible college. That is not found anywhere in Scripture. At this church, we try as close as possible to, to follow the pattern that we have found in Scripture for doing things. The reason why I didn't go to Bible college before I became a pastor is because that is not a requirement to become a pastor. Now, the Bible does say that you're not to be a novice, but I'm not a novice. I've been at this for years. I've, been go, I've had ministries. I've done soul winning every week for the past nine years of my life. I've been being taught and trained by my pastor, and I have been doing my own studying and my own reading. I'm not a novice, and if you think I am, come and talk to me about the Bible after, after service and see if I'm a novice for yourself. And I'm not trying to lift myself up. I'm just saying I meet the qualifications that the Bible has laid out. You don't need to go to an institution. And it's the same thing with, secular, with the secular schools. You don't have to go to college to be educated. We have libraries. We have resources. You can meet people that are extremely educated, that are extremely driven, that are very smart, that never went to college one day in their life. You don't have to. You don't equate college or university with being intelligent or with being smart or being able to, to, to have a good message, or to have a, a true message. Studying God's word is what's going to make you, along with all the other qualifications of being a pastor, but... It can be a child. A child can bring forth the message of Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for you, but you don't dismiss it just because it's coming from a child. If it's a true message, if what they're saying is the truth, hey, the truth is the truth. The truth didn't come from me. I didn't make this stuff up. I'm not going to take credit for God's word. This is God's word. I'm just here trying to repeat and trying to teach it. I didn't come up with any of this stuff on my own. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, you don't have to turn if you would to Matthew chapter 15. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul kind of answers this, this argument while people have trying to, to, to lower, you know, why we ought not to, to listen to people. Oh, you, didn't even, you don't have a degree. You're not a doctor. You're not all these other things. Then, you know, people don't want to take you seriously. The Apostle Paul had this problem too where people are trying to say, say the same thing about him. I mean, think about the disciples. John, James, Peter, they were fishermen. I mean, Jesus literally got them from, from working on their boats, doing manual labor job, just, just catching fish, to following him and teaching and preaching God's word. They didn't have any, any accolades. They didn't have any letters after their name to distinguish them and say that they are now qualified to teach God's word. No, but they were with Jesus. And they learn directly from the source. And that's more valuable than any Bible college is going to do for you. Look, at, and, and I'll read for you from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. The Bible says, Do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or need we, as some others, epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? He's saying, do I need somebody else's approval, like someone writing out a letter saying, yeah, you can listen to this guy to give to you? Do I need that? Do I need letters from you to, to commend me to other people? He says, you, ye are our epistle written in our hearts, 
known and read of all men. He's saying, you can judge whether or not what I'm doing is right based on the fruit of my work. He says, you're my epistle. You are my letter of commendation. You people that, that, that I have helped teach and bring to the Lord and, and you know, impacted the lives of, you're our epistle written in our hearts. Verse 3, For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshy tables of the heart. And this is how you, could, how you can judge any preacher or any prophet, the Bible, when the Bible talks about you may know them by their fruits, it's talking about how you can identify a false teacher or a false prophet. You can look at the fruits of their labor. Look at what they're doing. Look at the converts they're bringing forth. Look at, look at what they're doing. If, if they're doing good, if they're reaching people, if they're, if they're bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ to the lost, hey, that is good fruit. And that's how you can know whether or not what someone's preaching is the truth or not. That's what, that's what the Apostle Paul says. It's not, it's not about you know, how many uh, accolades you have or letters of commendation you have. Uh, you're in Matthew chapter 15. We're going to see how Jesus is responding. Well, the, the main subject of the sermon tonight is being offended. right? Being offended at preaching and being prepared you know, so that you're not offended at what other people have to say and that we can just receive God's word. Jesus offended people. You know, a lot of people like to paint this picture of Jesus Christ like he was some real soft-spoken person and just was real passive and just wouldn't, you know, nobody got offended and everybody loved him. That's not true at all. If that was true, then Jesus would never have been nailed to a cross if everybody loved him. The fact of the matter is there's people that hated him and wanted him dead. Matthew 15, chapter 12 says... Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? So don't you know that you offended the Pharisees? I mean, the Pharisees, they're these religious leaders. Don't you know you offended him? And I love Jesus' response. He says, But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. He says, I'm not worried about that. Basically, what he's calling them here is false teachers. He's saying they're not from God. And he's right. I mean, they're, they're contradicting Jesus Christ, and they're offended at what he's saying. They're not of God. These Pharisees were false prophets. He says, every plant that God has not planted, he says, they're going to they're gonna be rooted up. And Jesus Christ, he wasn't worried about it. He's saying, okay, well, I offended him. So what? Look at John chapter 6. We're going to see another chapter, another, another illustration of Jesus offending people. John chapter 6 is a chapter where, where Jesus Christ said that he's the bread of life. And he's the one that said, you know, that, that you must eat of his flesh and drink of his blood in order to have eternal life, basically. I'm paraphrasing, but that's what, what he was kind of preaching in that chapter. And in John chapter, or John chapter 6, verse number 60, look at verse number 60, the Bible reads, Many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is an hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at, now look, before it was the Pharisees, now this time it's his disciples. So this is a hard saying. This is some hard preaching. Who, who can hear this? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? So, oh, are you offended at my preaching? Verse 62. What and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is the Spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except that were given unto him of my Father. Look at verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. They were offended at his preaching so much that they, they left him. They stopped following Jesus Christ. They walked no more with him. 
Verse 67, now how did Jesus respond to that? Did he run up to him and say, oh, I'm sorry for offending you, just come back. I don't want you to be offended. No, he said, then said Jesus unto the 12, verse 67, will ye also go away? He said, okay, they all left. They're gone. They don't, they're not going to follow me anymore. They got offended at my preaching. Are you going to go too? Basically, go ahead. The door's right there. You don't have to follow me either. Jesus Christ was going to preach the truth no matter who it offended. No matter what the outcome, he said, I've got a job to do. I'm going to preach God's word. And you know what? I've got a job to do. As a pastor of this church, my job is to preach the whole counsel of God. I'm going to preach all of it. I'm going to, I love preaching on the good stuff. It's great. I've got plenty of sermons. I preach on all the good news out of the Bible because there's so much good. But I'm also going to preach the stuff that's not so good, the stuff that, that many people consider to be bad. I don't consider any part of the Bible bad. You could say positive or negative, maybe. There's some negative consequences for sin. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's not fun or pleasant, but it's the truth. And people need to hear that because just as much as my children need to understand that there's consequences for their actions, that they can't just do whatever they want and get away with it. Hey, we're the same way. We're God's children. We need to know that we can't just do whatever we want in this world and get away with it, that there's consequences. Now, it's not fun. It's not fun disciplining my children. It's not the best, like I have the, 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 my best time in the world is when I discipline my children. No. But it's necessary, it's needful, and we need to hear all of the Bible. We need to hear everything so that we can be balanced and so that we can just try to do more for being um, closer to him. Now, the goal, so don't mistake me, the goal is not to be offensive just for the sake of being offensive. I don't stand up here and say, how can I offend people today? That's not the point, and that shouldn't be the point for any Christian. You know, we're not out trying to just offend people. God's word will, will take care of people getting offended. It's going to happen. But we don't try to just say things just to be more offensive. The Bible says in Romans 12, 18, If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. God wants us to get along with people. He wants us to live peaceably. And, and believe me, I try to do that. And I don't, you know, I don't really have any enemies that, that I'm aware of. I don't, I don't have, like, uh, there's probably people that hate me out there, but, you know, I, I don't go around making enemies. I try to live peaceably with all men. Now, I have my beliefs. I'm definitely steeped in my beliefs, and I have convictions about the Bible, what God's Word says, and I believe every word of this book, and that offends people. But I don't go around just trying to throw things in people's face, if you know what, you know, and just, and just trying to offend them. That's not the point. I try to live peaceably with all men. Matthew chapter 17 there's a story here. I'll just read it for you in verse 24. Turn, if you would, to Matthew 24. Matthew 24. I'm going to read Matthew 17 for you. The Bible reads, And when they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money came to Peter and said, Doth not your master pay tribute? He saith, Yes. And when he was come into the house, Jesus prevented him, saying, What thinkest thou, Simon? Of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? Of their own children or of strangers? Peter saith unto him, Of strangers, Jesus saith unto him, Then are the children free. So, what's happening here is that the tax collector came unto Peter. And he's saying, You know, doesn't your master pay tribute? You know, doesn't he pay taxes? And Peter's like, Yeah. And then when he came back to the house where Jesus was, Jesus, you know, stopped him before he could even say anything. He says, Peter. You know, who pays tax? Who, you know, the kingdoms of the earth, who pays taxes? He's like, the, 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 the citizens or the foreigners? And at this time, the, the, the way the government was set up, it was only the foreigners that were, that were required to pay tribute, that were required to pay the taxes, because they are the ones in bondage. But the, but the citizens, they, didn't, they weren't supposed to have to pay anything. And he says, Peter answered them, well, the strangers, yeah, they're the ones that pay tribute. And Jesus says, well, then are the children free? He's like, we don't have to pay this. This is not, you know, we don't have to pay tribute. But look what he says. He says in verse 27, Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, go thou to the sea and cast an hook and take up the fish uh, that first cometh up. And when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money that take and give unto them for me and thee. He's saying, look, we don't even need to pay this. It's not right. We don't have to pay a tribute money. But let's not offend them. Let's not make a big stink over this. Let's not cause a lot of problems. 
It's just money. Go ahead, go out, take this money out of the fish's mouth and just pay that for him. Just pay the money and get it over with. It's not that big of a deal. We're not gonna, we're not gonna invest our time fighting this battle. We don't need to do it, but we're going to do it anyways. And you know, honestly, that's the kind of the way, on a, on a completely separate note, that's the way I feel about taxes in general. There's a lot of taxes that I don't believe that we're required to pay, and there's a lot of, there's all kinds of reasoning behind that. But you know what? I do it anyways. It's not a battle I want to fight. If you want their stinking money, look, I don't care about the money. Take the money. And that's what Jesus did here. Uh, Psalm 120 verse 7 says, I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. So David's saying, look, I'm for peace. I don't want to have fights. I don't want to have these big wars. But the words that I say, they offend people. And because of the words I speak, they're for war. They want to fight me. Now, Matthew 24 is a, is a chapter about the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's what this whole chapter is about. And the closer that we get to Jesus coming back, to his return the more that people are going to be getting offended by the word because there's going to be more unrighteousness, more sin. There's a great apostasy, the great falling away of the church and, and people getting more and more into sin. And the Bible says in Matthew 24, verse 8, it says, All these are the, beginnings of, the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. He's warning what they're going to do to Christians. He's saying, look, for the name, for Jesus' name, you're going to be hated of all of everybody, all nations. Everybody's going to hate you. Verse 10, and then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. It's just going to be getting worse. And you know, the reason why, turn if you would to John chapter 16. The reason why I'm going into so much detail on this tonight, it's a little bit of a longer sermon, but People are going to continue to get more and more offended at God's word. It's going to happen. We need to be prepared for that. We need to understand that it's going to happen. And don't let that shake you. Don't let that scare you off from, from being bold and proclaiming God's word. John 16, Jesus explains why he's, even, he's given us these warnings. Look at verse number 1 of John 16. He says, These things have I spoken unto you, that ye should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God service. He's saying people are going to be out to kill you and they think they're actually doing the right thing. They think that they're actually doing the will of God by killing you. That's how backwards things are going to be. That's how twisted people's minds are going to be. They're going to think that when they come to kill you, they're going to think it's a great thing. They're going to think they're getting rid of the heretics just like the Pharisees thought with Jesus Christ. They thought Jesus Christ was a heretic for claiming to be the Son of God. They're saying, no, you, you can't be the Son of God. And they hated him so much. They, were, they thought he was a blasphemer. They thought he had the devil. When he was doing all his great miracles, they thought that because he was doing these great miracles that he was getting power from Satan to do those miracles. That's what they thought about Jesus Christ, and that's why they put him to death. So the same way that they thought about Jesus, he says, in the end times, that's the way it's going to be for Christians, for people who claim the name of Christ. They're going to be thinking they're actually doing a good thing for God, but they're going to hate you. And he says, look, I've spoken these things unto you that you shouldn't be offended. Knowing, having that foreknowledge, knowing in advance that stuff's going to happen, can prevent you from being offended and will help you to stay strong and to stay grounded and to stay founded and not to be one of those seeds that, that's sown in the stony place, but the seed that's sown in the good ground and we can be rooted down and stand firm. He says in verse uh, 3, And these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things have I told you that when the time shall come, ye re may remember that I told you of them. And these things I said not unto you at the beginning because I was with you, saying, I'm telling you these things so you can remember. When it starts to happen, remember these words. Remember what I said. I told you it was going to happen. You can take comfort in that, knowing that, oh yeah, Jesus told us about this. And we know the end of things. We know that... that Christ is our Savior. We know that, that even though we might have to face in our lifetime. Now look, I think the end times are real near. That's my personal opinion on the matter. I think, I think we're getting really close to that time of Jesus Christ. If that's the case, we need to be prepared. If not, we, you know, we ought to be prepared anyways because we don't know the day or the hour. We ought to just make sure that we're ready. 
And the way that we're ready is being just grounded in God's word and that we could just remain firm in his word. Now, we live in a world that takes offense to scripture and sound doctrine. Don't you ever be ashamed to proclaim the truth from God's word. You may have a lot of coworkers or friends or people who, who frankly won't like to hear what you have to say about, God, about the Bible, about God's word and what God's word teaches. They're going to try to make you feel bad about believing everything the Bible says to be true. I've literally had someone even today try to make me feel bad about what we were doing in going out and preaching Jesus Christ to people at their house. I had someone try to make me feel bad about that. They said, they said it's terrible for you. Here's what they said to me. They said, it's terrible for you to tell people that they're going to go to hell. And what they don't understand is, look, we need to understand it's a reality. Okay, I'm not the one sending that person to hell. I didn't make things the way they are. I didn't write the Bible. But you know what? The Bible is the truth. It's God's word. God's the one who created hell. God's the one who gave us his laws and said that if you break my laws, you deserve this punishment. People need to know this. It's education. Look, people need to understand. I would want to know if I'm driving in my car and it's real dark outside and maybe my headlights are off and there's this big lake in front of me. Oh, that's a terrible, I can't believe you'd tell them that there's a lake there and warn them about that destruction that's going to happen or at the edge of a cliff, right? Can't see the edge of the cliff, I'm just driving along. Don't you think I'd want someone to tell me, hey, if you keep going this way, it's just destruction, you're going to die. No, I'd, I'd rather have someone to, obviously, I mean, it's kind of a silly question. Of course I want someone to tell me that. Well, look, hell is a real place. And we need to warn people, say, look, hell's real. The Bible talks about it. Jesus talked about it. God talks about it. It's a horrible place, and you ought not to go there, but we deserve that place because we've sinned. But there is a way out. There's good news. All you have to do is put your faith in Christ. And I had a person tell me today and try to discourage me from going out and talking to more people that that was terrible. What I was just terrible. Terrible what I was doing. I can't believe that you're saying that. I can't believe that you'd say someone would go to hell. I need to. It's in God's word. It's the truth. Don't let people try to stop you from speaking the truth. We need to remain firm. The Bible says in Romans chapter 1, I know we read part of this earlier, but earlier in the chapter it says, So much as in me is... I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. We ought never to be ashamed of God's word. We ought never be ashamed of Jesus. The world's going to try to make you ashamed. They'll say, oh, you... You mean you believe that? You believe what the Bible says about homosexuals? You believe what the Bible says about, about the death penalty and, and who needs to be put there? You, you mean you believe that? You're right, I do. I absolutely do, and I'm not ashamed of it. Look, God's law is perfect. God's word is perfect. <coughs> God's word is light and life and truth. Just because you may not like it doesn't make it any less true. And just, you know, don't, don't let people offend you and, and try not to be easily offended as a Christian. Like I said, I'm a pastor where, where all of my, you know, I, I'm always available. I try to make myself as available as possible. If something is taught or said, please come and see me after, after the service. I will try my best to, to, to show you from the Bible why I believe it. Because every once in a while I might say something and not back it up with Scripture. I try not to do that, but it happens. And you decide for yourself. You know, I encourage everybody here to, to, to judge what I say based on what the Bible says, to, to look for yourself, and everybody needs to be reading the Bible on their own so that you can't be deceived by people trying to, trying to twist Scripture. But we need to make sure that we're not offended. And you know what? Some people may get offended at God's word, but we don't need to worry about that. We're going to stand in the truth of the Bible. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words.
God, your word doesn't change. Our culture changes, society changes, people's attitude about different things change. Sometimes things are acceptable, sometimes they're not. Sometimes people look at, at, at sins as being a big deal, sometimes they don't as, as our culture changes. But Lord, you, your word never changes. Whether things are in season or out of season, Lord, we're going to believe them and I'm going to preach them, dear God. And my intent is not that people would be offended tonight. I am not trying to go and, and make people offended, Lord. I think you know my heart, but I pray that you would please help us to be strengthened and grounded and founded in your word, dear Lord, that we can just accept what it says, that we love you, we love you for the free gift you've given us, and we love all of the wisdom that you have for us in the Bible, dear Lord. Help us to, to never be ashamed or offended, but that we would stand firm in your words. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.